okay so what should fathers be doing you know what are they actually supposed to be doing that's that's my question first of all is there a natural way to father um the reason i'm asking this is that i think that there are many across society that have the impression that men aren't really designed for looking after babies you know the the idea often is that women are biologically predisposed to be carers you know to look after children while men are not um, and in this talk, I want to blow that idea right out of the water. <laughs> I would say that to start with. So what then is the natural way to father? Well, if we look at things from a biological perspective, the answer is it depends. So um, um, right. um, it depends on the options available to a man, basically. You know, fathers, like all humans, are very flexible in the strategies to follow. In fact, you know, we're more flexible than any other mammal. And the best way to be a dad is going to depend on what the kids need from him and what he's actually in a position to provide. Now, if anything can be viewed as the natural way for, for dads to be, the best place to look is going to be in people who live like our ancestors did, you know, as we were evolving and human roles were taking shape. So the people who come closest to this living today are the small remaining populations around the world of hunter-gatherers. Now these are people who make their living directly from the land, you know, without farming or anything. So what do hunter-gatherer hunter dads do? Well, these are hunter-gatherers. These are Hadza men from Tanzania. Now they go off maybe for days at a time, they hunt big game, while women tend to stay closer to home and gather plant foods and small game, and actually you know, do a much more reliable job of feeding the family actually. But um, mothers live with their female relatives, and so there are grannies and aunties around to help look after the kids. This brings fathers up to go off to hunt their big game, um, you know, they don't have to look after the children. And so that means they get to show off and when they come back with a large lump of meat and they can share it around the camp. So although they're doing stuff to provide for their children, you know, had the dads that aren't exactly hands on. But so that's not the only way that, that hunter gatherer dads behave. Um, these are also members of a hunter gathering tribe and they do fathering very differently. Now this is a a father and son from the Aka tribe of Central Africa. Now Aka dads are the world champions when it comes to hands-on fathering. They spend nearly half of their waking hours in contact with their kids. I mean physical contact with their kids a lot of the time. They're equally likely as mums to feed their kids, care for them, play with them. They're in a position to do this because Aka hunt using nets in the forest in family groups and so basically the fathers are around their kids most of the time, they're, they're actually there with them. And also fathers need to do this, they're, they're needed to look after their kids because the family lives with the father's kin and so the mother doesn't have her female relatives around to help, as, as in the case of the Hadza women. So the point here is that even in hunter-gatherers, where you'd expect dads to be doing what dads are designed for you know, by evolution, there's actually a huge variation in what dads do. It really depends very much on what's possible, what the children need from their fathers in the particular circumstances they're living in. There's not one single natural way for dads to be. So that then raises the question, what should fathers be doing here in our society then? Well, for a lot of the 20th century, men in this part of the world were expected to be the main earners. And so a good dad was one who brought home the bacon and he certainly wasn't expected to take much time off to change nappies and look after kids. That tended to work in the 1950s on the whole. Um, I'm sure there were exceptions, but generally families survived then on a, a single wage and mothers tended to stay home and they probably had family relatively nearby to help out. So it made sense then that the man concentrated on bringing home a wage to support his family. But nowadays, as people increasingly tend to move away from family to work, you know, especially professionals, um, dads are needed to pitch in with childcare. And given that women have now taken on a huge share of the earning burden, it makes total sense for men to share in the work and the joy of raising the kids at home. You think it might, you know, you might think it's a no brainer, but 
it seems that there's a mismatch among quite a lot of our population between our attitudes towards fathering and our needs in the modern world. And this mismatched attitude can often be found in the workplace too. So men simply are not expected to take much time out of their jobs to be involved in childcare. And if they do, they often face a serious backlash. They might not be seen as serious about their jobs and then they get passed over for promotion. And it's absolutely, obviously, not that men can't do parenting. You know, those ACA fathers, um, as well as, you know, tons of stay-at-home dads in this part of the world, they're testament to that, obviously. But a lot of people seem locked into the idea that mothers have some natural-born instinct to look after babies that men don't have. And it's simply not true. There is no biological reason why men can't look after babies and children as well as women aside from breastfeeding, obviously. Now, women's hormone levels change with pregnancy and childbirth to help them with the demands of motherhood. Um, but the arrival of a baby also sets off a hormonal response in men. It's not exactly the same as a mother's, but it's definitely there. And the more involved a dad is with his baby, the bigger the hormonal response is going to be. So there are changes in at least three hormones in fathers who look after infants. The first one of these is prolactin. Um, now, we usually think of this as a female hormone. This prepares the mother to lactate or breastfeed. But actually, the levels of this hormone rise in men, you know, while their partners are pregnant, you know, especially if they're kind of involved in the, the whole proceedings. And then when the baby arrives, it doesn't mean that men start producing milk, obviously, but it does produce more nurturing behaviour in men. Another hormone that rises is oxytocin. Now, you've probably heard of this. It's the kind of love hormone, the bonding hormone. This is a hormone that helps us form new bonds, and that includes the bonds between parent and child. The level of this hormone rises um, in fathers-to-be, um, in the same way as it, it, it rises in their partners when they're living together through pregnancy and the man's involved in that. And then finally, there is testosterone. Now, this doesn't rise in fathers, it drops. So testosterone levels drop in men living with a pregnant partner and then living with the baby. And the more hands-on the dad is, the more his testosterone levels drop. Now, I think that's interesting that that happens because the function of high testosterone levels in men prepares them for competition with other men. That response has evolved to increase sexual access to women. But when men get into committed relationships, and then even more when they become fathers, their testosterone levels drop significantly and their focus changes away from competition towards spending energy on caring for their newborn and being more cooperative with their partners. So hormones play a big part here. But with hormones, it's a two-way street. The hormone changes in men make them more responsive and caring towards their babies, but also caring for the babies, you know, um, induces hormone changes. So you get kind of a, a positive feedback situation. The men who don't look after their babies, who don't get, you know, involved, um, they don't go through this biological change. They don't have a, a change in their hormones in the same way. So what does all this mean then? Well, it means that the truth is that far from being unable to look after babies and children, these hormonal responses I've been describing show that men are biologically adapted to be good at childcare if that's what they choose to do, if that's what they're allowed to do. There are no excuses for treating men as if they can't do it. And of course, that also means that men can't use the excuse that they can't do it either. By the way, I, I'm, I'm saying, you know, in saying this, it might seem as if I'm making the assumption that everyone wants equality in, you know, both childcare and work. Some couples are happy to have a division of labour. There's certainly no problem with this if that's what both parties want. Um, you know, as I said, humans are eminently flexible. It just depends on the situation that you're in. But for many people, a big step towards equality is exactly what is wanted. <clears throat> and there are often barriers to achieving that. And some of these are around the attitudes about which gender should be doing what. However, I think we're at a perfect point in our history 
of our society for fathers to take a role in childcare equal to that of mothers. Women more and more are doing their bit for gender equality by earning an increasing proportion of the household income. So it completely follows that men should step up and take on a, a more equal share of childcare and domestic work. But it's not happening that much, not, not in equal shares anyway. Of course, you know, there are many men that would love to spend more time with their kids, but they don't feel that they can take paternity leave and time off for family stuff, even where it's offered, because they might fear that they'll be seen as not serious about their job. And, you know, employers might think, well, that's fine. It saves the aggro and expense of covering for fathers. But I think that would be a mistake on the part of employers. There's some research um, from the University of Edinburgh that's been done, which demonstrates that encouraging fathers to take leave will more than pay for itself in terms of staff engagement and retention. So clearly it makes sense for leaders to step up and promote a pro-fathering culture in the workplace, and it's going to be better for everyone. And now I'd like to go through some of the reasons why I think it would be such a good thing to have a more, more involved fathers. Now, first of all, I think it will be better for fathers, better for mothers, better for gender equality. Fathers who want greater work-life balance, those who want to be hands-on parents, they're obviously going to be happier with, with better arrangements. So this means that employers who prioritise supporting dads with good parental leave arrangements and greater flexibility, they're going to attract and retain talented fathers. But not only that, they'll be helping women too. You know, clearly if dads are home, mums have more freedom to pursue their careers. But it's not just that. When, it's, when fathers start expecting more parental leave and time off to look after, say, a sick child, flexibility stops being a women's issue and it starts making good business sense overall. So this means that companies with good policies around flexibility for all working parents you know, they'll have a reduced penalty for motherhood and, you know, that will kind of naturally lead on to a reduction in um, the, uh, the gender pay gap. So that's going to be a good thing. But to get the biggest benefit in terms of equality of opportunity, men need to get involved with their kids right from the start. This has been shown in the research, even during pregnancy. So what I'm talking about here is, you know, obviously helping to get the house ready and stuff, buying the kit, but also helping to make plans around birth, talking to the bump on a regular basis, singing to the bump, whatever takes your fancy. Um, there's evidence from research carried out in Switzerland suggesting that for fathers, getting involved with the whole parenthood thing before the baby's even born predicts greater involvement of the father with their child as, as the child gets older. So, you know, the benefits are, are lasting. But for dads to be able to do this, um, they need to get some recognition and respect. Um, that, that's, I mean, from their partners, from their family, from their friends, their colleagues, and also, also from healthcare professionals. Um, I'm sure there's a, a huge variation in this, but you know, there's many dads that feel sidelined or excluded when it comes to discussions around the birth plan and that kind of thing. Um, they also often get left out when, you know, maybe the health visitor comes to visit after the baby's born. Um, you know, dad's sort of sitting in the corner feeling, you know, um, like a spare part. So, you know, do dads get asked about their well-being at this point? You know, obviously we know now that dads often get postnatal depression too. My point here is that to be an equal parent, fathers need to be treated as an equal parent. Um, and one thing that that involves is it's going to involve mums being prepared to relinquish their kind of societally sanctioned role as the primary parent. I'm not sure that this is always going to be easy for mums, having spoken to quite a few working mums, you know, who have had babies, they don't necessarily want to give up being seen as the main parent, even though they would like equality at home. But obviously, if we want equality, you know, it's going to cut both ways. Um, kids, they also stand to gain from dad being home more too, obviously. Fathers do parenting in a different way from mothers. Mothers tend to be a lot more protective and nurturing, 
while dads often teach and encourage their kids to you know, push the boundaries. So children with hands-on dads learn about dealing with challenges in the outside world. Um, they also interestingly experience gains in IQ and a, you know, a greater chance of upward social mobility compared with you know, kids that haven't got um, hands-on dads as they get older. This is all, all else being equal, obviously. Um, now, these conclusions come from a study of a huge data set of British children followed from birth through childhood and into adulthood. And what they found was the benefits of having an involved father were still apparent in people in their 40s. So, you know, this is a long lasting effect. The reason I'm mentioning all these benefits to kids is that if parents know about this and they feel confident that their kids are doing well because dad's involved, then it's going to you know, make them feel more confident that they've got their work life balance right. And it's going to make them feel happier with their jobs and the workplaces. So creating a, a workplace culture that values hands on dads makes for a happier workplace generally in a whole raft of different ways. Now, one of these is that it will naturally reduce levels of sexist behavior and sexual harassment. Um, you might think that's a big leap. How did I reach that conclusion? Well, as I said, I'm a biologist. I, I used to study animal behavior all over the place and uh, I like to kind of look at animal examples to explain things. So I'm gonna do that in this case. Um, first of all, let's look at a few animal species where males don't do any childcare, where males, where, where the fathers aren't involved. Um, so firstly, uh, if you like wildlife documentaries, you've probably seen footage of these guys. Now these are elephant seals. The males are absolutely huge. They're bigger, you know, much bigger than the females. And the males fight viciously for dominance and territory on the, you know, on the beach. And once one of them has inflicted enough you know, bloody wounds all over the other and seen him off, he gets sole access to all the females on his patch of beach. And I have to say, I must, you know, I think it must be truly terrifying to be a, a female elephant seal in this situation. <clears throat> um, another species where dads don't get too involved are chimpanzees. Now these are our closest relatives in the animal kingdom. Um, the males fight ferociously for dominance, um, since the dominant male will get priority of access to females for mating. Sorry about the quality of this photo, it was quite hard to find a, a picture of chimpanzees fighting. Um, but it gives you the idea. Male chimpanzees don't take any part in caring for young. Now, these are red deer males. They don't care for young. They spend their energy during the rut headbutting with other males to see who gets to hang out with the harem of females and sire the next season's little red deer. So basically, in animal species where paternal care isn't a thing, where dads aren't involved, the males fight a lot with each other to see who gets to have sex. That's what happens. Um, so what about animals where fathers do care for offspring, where you have dads getting involved? Well, we've all seen the penguins on David Attenborough programmes and how the males and females cooperate to look after their precious babies. You know, carefully taking turns to look after the egg and keep it warm and then taking turns to go off and get fish to regurgitate for their chick, which kind of looks disgusting. Um, these are titi monkeys. These are, are monkeys from South America and they're one of just a very few species of primate where fathers take care of babies. I couldn't find a picture of one with a baby, but uh, you know, this is, this is a, a titi couple. Um, males and females are highly cooperative and they spend their, their spare time huddled up together with their long tails intertwined. They're very cute. And another species where dads really get involved are albatrosses. Now they cooperate with the mum, just like penguins really, to keep their chick alive. The relationship between males and females is really lovely. You know, they, they bash their beaks together in joy at seeing each other again when one of them's been off fishing. That's very nice. So, overall, here are, um, if you look on the left hand side, those are the animals where dads don't look after the kids. And on the right hand side, there are the species where 
dads do look after the kids who, who take on a big role in looking after the babies. And I think you can see there's quite a big difference between the two lots. Where dads aren't hands-on, males tend to spend their time fighting for dominance, for sexual access to females. But where dads are hands-on, males don't tend to fight much at all. And there's a huge amount of cooperation between males and females. So what about humans then? Well, humans are very interesting. We're a very interesting species. We're unique among mammals in that men can choose whether to be involved with their kids or not. It's not set in stone as it tends to be for pretty much all other species. So for human fathers, their strategy will depend on their surroundings, you know, what works best for them, the culture around them. Um, you know, remember how even in our ancestral state as hunter-gatherers, whether men are hands-on dads depends on the circumstances and what's needed. So men might be fighting with each other, like male chimpanzees, probably to gain dominance and status. Or they might be cooperative with females working together, like penguins. It stands to reason then, if men are encouraged to take time off for their babies and kids and are respected for doing so, that's a crucial part of it, if they're getting the message that it's a good thing to be an involved father, then there's going to be a strategy shift for men towards more respect for women and more cooperation with women. It'll make even more difference if senior men are taking up their parental leave and, and you know, spending time with their kids and providing role models to other men. I mean, obviously this, you know, it depends on what stage of life men are when they get to be senior, but um, if it's possible, that would be great. And remember hormones are involved too. You know, men who take that hands-on approach to fatherhood experience a drop in their testosterone levels. Um, and we know that this corresponds to a strategy shift away from competition with other men and towards more cooperation with women. So, you know, it totally makes sense. Now, if we can harness men's nurturing side by changing the culture around fatherhood, then it's not going to be about dominance competition among men, with women being the sexual prize. You know, men are going to understand and empathise with mothers' needs for flexibility because they need it too, or, you know, they know they will do when they become dads. As far as I know, there hasn't been any research um, looking at the link between attitudes towards fathering rules and the incidence of sexist behaviour. Um, I'm not sure how you did design that, but there are certainly data suggesting a much lower level of sexism and sexual harassment in Scandinavian countries, and these have much better provision and uptake of paternal leave, um, or parental leave just for dads. Um, and I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that the two things are linked. So if we can drive cultural change in this way so that flexibility becomes a business imperative rather than you know, just some, some kind of annoyance, where there's greater cooperation and respect and where there's less overt competition for status, that also means we can get to a place where women will naturally gain more influence than they have at present, because women, as, as well as many men, tend to thrive in an environment that doesn't have a, a steep dominance structure. So if we can flatten out the hierarchy by reducing competition for status, it means that decisions can be made in a more inclusive way. So there are so many benefits from, you know, having a, 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 a sort of supportive attitude towards involved fathering, all these knock-on benefits. Um, so, you know, this mode of working means being able to look after people's needs for autonomy, their feelings of competence in their work, the opportunity to take care of their social and family relationships. These are the things that people have evolved to need. By meeting these needs, you know, we get a, a happy, healthy, productive workforce. So, you know, all this, this is pointing at the fact that sorting out this issue of equality for dads is going to provide a tipping point that will lead to a cascade of positive outcomes for, that benefit everyone. So, is someone trying to say something? I can't hear. Okay. I'll just carry on, but just tell me if you want me to stop. Um, yeah, I think the time has come for a pro-fathering culture. You know, it's win-win all around. So the question is, what's stopping us? Well, the barriers to, 
you know, greater involvement by fathers are economic and cultural. They're certainly not biological. That's the point. Culture is changing, but we need to speed things up. Um, we can do this if senior men are prepared to step up as role models and take their parental leave. Um, and we can provide forums for dads to get together with or without their kids, where being a dad is seen as enjoyable and a social opportunity. Um, the other vital step is to sort out the economics. And I have four words to say to that. Ring-fenced paternal leave. Thank well, actually, maybe six words. Ring-fenced, well-funded paternal leave. Um, it has to be well-funded. In countries where this is provided, notably Scandinavian ones again, men take a lot more time off for their kids than in the UK. Um, if the parental leave can't be shared, if it's a case of use it or lose it, then fathers tend to use it. And this leads to more equality and work-life balance all around. So um, that's, you know, what I have to say about, um, you know, in, encouraging fathers to, you know, a, a hands-on father role at work. Um, I'd just like to move on briefly to discuss the changes um, that the COVID-19 pandemic is causing when it comes to gender roles and childcare. Um, how are mothers and fathers dividing up the job of childcare and homeschooling while kids are not at school and when one or both parents are at home, um, either working for pay or not, as the case may be? Um, and then if fathers are spending more time with their kids as, as hands-on dads at the moment, could this lead to a more permanent change you know, once the restrictions are lifted? Um, well, this has been looked at by the Institute of Fiscal Studies. They commissioned a piece of research looking at nearly how nearly 5,000 parents in England divided up their time since late April, and they've been looking at the trends in behaviour among parents. Um, and I'll just go through a few of the things that they found. Um, unfortunately, if you're hoping for a change to a more equal parenting situation, you might be a bit disappointed. It doesn't look brilliant. Um, first of all, what they found was, obviously, no, no surprise, the pressure on parents' time is immense. So on average, parents are doing childcare for nine hours of the day, housework for three hours and paid work for three. This is just the average for, you know, all parents, fathers and mothers. Obviously, they're often doing, you know, more than one of these things at the same time. Um, mothers are more likely to have quit or lost their job or to have been furloughed since the start of lockdown. Um, compared with fathers, mothers are spending less time on paid work, but more on household responsibilities. Um, and even when they are doing paid work, they're, they're, they're more likely to be interrupted with other stuff. Um, the difference in work patterns between mothers and fathers have grown since before the crisis. They haven't reduced, unfortunately. Um, and families respond differently to a partner stopping paid work, depending on whether it's the mother or the father who stops. So if it's the mother who stops um, while her partner continues working, the mother does twice as much uh, domestic stuff as she did before. In the reverse situation where the father has stopped working, but the mother's still working, the parents share childcare and housework equally. So the mother still has to do her job on top of all that. Um, and then, but the last one, a slightly more positive, is that um, despite doing less childcare than mothers during lockdown, fathers have nearly doubled the time they spend on childcare. So, you know, perhaps there's some kind of potential for, you know, that increased childcare to continue. So overall, then, it doesn't look great for anyone hoping for a massive culture change towards greater equality in parenting. Um, things seem to be even more inequitable than ever, with women more likely, likely to have stopped paid work since lockdown began. And even if they are doing some paid work, women are doing fewer hours than men and more likely to be juggling that with looking after the kids. <clears throat> but as I said, on a more positive note, there is a big increase on the, in the average time that fathers spend looking after children. Um, so this could create the impetus for longer lasting change, but obviously that's an open question. My take on this is that the situation during lockdown underlines even more the change in attitudes we need around what ge different genders should and can be doing. You know, the fact that fathers are still doing less than mothers 
even when they're both at home, suggests to me that at least in some cases, men are still feeling pressure to concentrate on the paid work, um, you know, because that's ex what's expected of them. It could be, of course, that some men prefer it this way. You know, maybe they'd rather focus on their careers than on more domestic pursuits. Um, again, that might be because that's what's expected. It's an open question and, you know, maybe a bit controversial. So it could be an interesting focus for our discussion now. So perhaps that's a good place for me to stop. Um, just before I do, I'll give you some ways to connect with me, follow me, contact me. Um, I won't offer to share my slides today because as you've seen, they're, they're mostly pictures, but um, I've put together a summary sheet with the main points of the presentation. So if, um, if you email me at the address, mary at marymcleod.com here, um, I can send it to you very happily. So thank you very much. Thank you.